Hey everybody, thanks for joining us today. Hope it looks and sounds okay out there. And um, I just was thinking, I've been trying for like the last five years to change to the European way of counting down because it makes so much more sense, you know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you don't end up with that awkward three. But uh, old habits are ingrained. Let's see, skip add on the iPad and just make sure it seems okay. How's the sound today? Any weirdness? I, th I did a test before this and the sync was just about perfect. But um, I never know until I see stuff. And I will get to your question on the, uh, on the very act there. Good morning there, Brad. Let's see, five, four, and then three, two, one. It's really one. It's really easy to count up. It's hard for me to remember how to do the counting down thing. Uh, yeah, I need to make sure I've got all the all comments good. All right, all right. Now here's a real question for you because it's hot. It's really hot in Memphis, and this is the hottest room in the house. And I've got all this equipment here. If I turn on this fan here. Is it add a bunch of noise in the background for you guys? Because uh, I don't want it to be noisy for you, but at the same time, I don't want to start sweating 30 minutes in. And I'm going to scroll back up here and catch this first question here. Howdy, Lyle. Thanks for sharing your knowledge and expertise. Well, you know, I, what, what little I have, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to share. Can I talk about Variax? Yeah, I can. In fact, uh, the thumbnail for this video was my old Variac, which looks like it's straight out of a James Whale movie. It could be on the set of Frankenstein. But um, uh, are, there, are the newer ones around the $100 price point worth buying? They can be uh, if, it, if uh, the current capacity of the transformer, uh, the Variac, is up to what you're going to be powering it with. You know, a 5 amp will do most guitar amps just fine, but if you're doing an SVT, you need a lot more, et cetera, et cetera. The main issue I have with the ones that people tend to get, which are like the red ones from, from China, the Parts Express, et cetera, sell, is that the uh, the uh, knob is never calibrated. So it's set, and it says it's 120 volts, but you have no way of knowing that that's what you're going to actually get. Pardon me just a second. <clears throat> so if you buy one, the first thing I do when a client brings one in is I give it actual 120 volts straight measured exactly 120 volts and then I turn the knob the pot until I get 120 volts out of it and then it usually it's not lined up to the 120 setting at that point so I'll take the the uh, set screw out and turn the knob until it, the line matches where the 120 volts is and I'll retighten at that point uh, there's a one-to-one -one relationship but you still have to know what the wall voltage coming into one is because that wall voltage reading coming out of those is usually only accurate if you're actually giving 110, 120 volts in, or 240 in other countries, whatever the case may be. But, um, you know, so if you have 109 coming in, and you think you're set to whatever voltage coming out, you probably aren't. Some of them have better meters than others, but as long as you know what your, all the variables are, there's no reason that the little $80 ones can't be fine. The one I've got that's in the thumbnail for this is from like the 40s or 50s. And aside from adding a uh, defeatable ground to it, it's still just fine. Hello to everyone. Uh, aha. There's a good one for, for us all. Hey, Lyle, do you prefer linear audio taper pots, potentiometers, for guitar con tone controls? Assuming you mean specifically for the tone control, always, always audio. Because if you have linear, then you're going to have almost no change from 2 to 10, and all the change is going to be from 2 to 0. So all the change in a very small window and then nothing. Whereas with audio, you're going to have all the change in a fair wider spot and then subtle changes up to, up to the top. Um, linear taper would only work if you were to use a very large capacitor, typically, and a relatively small value uh, uh, pot so that as soon as you turn that pot down, you're gonna be sending a lot of signal uh, through the cap. And I was thinking about doing a video 
on this subject and, and guitar volumes and guitar wirings in general, people don't understand what the tone cap does. Um, but uh, it's in parallel with your guitar's pickups. It's in parallel with the pots. It, it, se it's, it seems more complicated than it is, but it's a parallel resistance, you know, a, par a, par a capacitor in parallel to a resistance. And so you can figure out what the frequency is. And um, it gets... It's a fairly simple thing on the face of it, but because you can have more than one pickup and more than one volume and tone pot active at the same time, there can be some complicating factors. But in general, uh, while someone who's playing jazz who never wants to change the response of their amplifier, they just want to have the volume change as they play, linear can make sense for a volume pot versus uh, rock, blues, country, where you don't want to have a clean amp and a dirtier amp as you turn your guitar down. In order to do that, you need a bigger volume change from the instrument. That's where audio taper is better for most players for, for volume. For the tone circuit, you almost always, always want to have audio taper. Hello to everyone. If I don't uh, call out anyone in particular, it's because there's too many people to call it everyone, but um, yay, I'm glad that the fan's on uh, and I can survive that. Thank you for the compliment there, Brad. I thought it was a, a lovely photo. I'm trying to learn how to use the damn camera, as I've mentioned, uh, like in that video I did yesterday of, uh, of Dave playing um, my, my 335 through his top hat. I was like, well, let me try some focus pulls and zooming and stuff. Only a few really, really clumsy move where I forgot, moves where, I, first of all, I forgot which way goes in and out on the focus and the zoom because I'm not used to doing it in real time. Um, and then I thought I had the, the pan set much more smoothly on the tripod, but it jerked. So someday I'll, I'll be a real, real boy. The red ones are trash, Brad says about the Variax. They're not always trash, but they're not great. But, you know, a high quality one costs two or three times as much as those red ones do. And most people don't really need, they're not going to be using it for the same things you and I use ours. I mean, the one I have is insanely high quality, but um, I can feel the, the wires uh, uh, gr kind of being gritty inside when I turn the knob. It's it's hard to do a smooth turn on. But you know the the red ones typically are fine I, I, in my experience. Now, Brad, you might have run into some terrible ones, or maybe there's a difference between the ones sold for the U.S. market at 120 versus Australia at 240. So, hey, Flame Topology, thanks for joining us. You're new to the chat, so it's always good to, to see new people joining us. Everyone is always welcome. If you're watching this but are not subscribed, either during the stream or afterwards, uh, I primarily keep the live chat part only for subscribers to keep out all the sex bots and all the, the garbage that gets flooded in here with people trying to give away, you know, you've won a free contest or click here to see my, my, my pictures and all that garbage. But the other benefit is it does give some incentive to subscribe if you want to ask your question. And before I get, go any farther, I do want to say, again, while any top chats are always appreciated, they're not necessary uh, for me to answer your question. I will answer as many questions as possible. So I will shut up and get back to Flame Topology's question. 65 Princeton Reverb, 1x12 Tweed Combo. Is this a decent little amp? It is a decent little amp. Uh, see my videos on ways to upgrade uh, the reliability <clears throat> of the Fender Reissue series. I think I show a Princeton specifically in one of those. Uh, but the Princeton, the Twin, the Super, the Deluxe, they're all variants on the same idea, but they have the same very simple things you can do to make them last a lot longer, including just making sure the hardware is tight. For more on that, see the video that'll be going up tomorrow on this uh, old Champ 12 and the dangers of loose hardware. All the 65 reissue Princetons are the same amp inside. They put them in different cabinets, whether it's black or, or tweed. Uh, the tweed one, um, I believe, is a Sweetwater 
thing with the one by twelve. The pro- I think if that one has the cannabis Rex, I don't like that speaker in fenders. It's subjective, but um, and I also subjectively don't like a a sixties amp chassis and 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 faceplate and knobs in a tweed cabinet. It's it's too anachronistic to me. I like I like my tweeds to be tweeds and my sixties to be sixties and ne'er the twain should meet. But that is subjective. It is a good amp. It just prone to the same almost minor issues if they're addressed soon enough that the other reissue series amps have. Zutalures. What two brands would you tend to avoid? Well, it's nice that there are more tubes in production again and available on the market so we can have more of a choice. Um, for the last two years, being too picky wasn't really possible. In general, blanket statements to follow, but the, every blanket statement has been backed up in my experience by a lot of examples. Electroharmonics preamp tubes. The ones which are silver print and say 7025, they're fine, they're good. Electroharmonics 12AX7s with the yellow print, absolute garbage. Toss them. Uh, Tungsol 12AX7s used to be great, and then before the tube shortage started, I was encountering a whole bunch of them which had uh, hum issues in fenders and a lot of bleed between channels. And uh, I've not tried them since because they bec- they were off the market for so long. I hope when they do come back that they will be uh, that issue will be corrected. Electroharmonic Softec, uh, Mullard reissue and Tongsol preamp tubes don't use in a cathode follower position, whether that's V2 of a Marshall, V2 of, of a Vox. They don't really handle the high uh, cathode voltage in that circuit. They're fine in other positions. Um, uh, JJ's, uh, the 6L6s and 6V6s can go microphonic in, in, in combos. All their other power tubes are fine. Their preamp tubes have had some bad glass at a fairly high rate recently, and I'm not sure why that is or how to predict it, but some of them just lose vacuum. If they're, you know, they're fine, you put them in the app, they're fine, five minutes later they've lost vacuum. The flip side of that is that Tube Amp Doctor is selling one that they call the, their Red Base 12X7 or ECC83, which for all, seems to be a JJ, but it seems to be a much better so- sourced JJ, uh, uh, additional quality uh, filtering on that. And I've had no problems with the Tube Amp Doctor Red Base labeled ECC83s, whereas the, the pretty much the same tube sold as uh, a JJ had some some glass issues of the, in the last year or two. Uh, rule of thumb: never buy Gold Lion or any of these other things that it's cryogenically treated. Or if you're paying more than forty dollars for a new uh, preamp tube, someone's hosing you. Um, Gold Lion doesn't make tubes. I don't remember the other company out there that's doing the same thing. Brad will probably have that for you or someone will chime in. I, I don't mean to pick on Gold Lion exclusively. I'd like to pick on everyone who does this, but I can't remember the other names. But they're just buying tubes that other people have made, Softex, uh, JJ's, Chinese tubes, whatever, and marketing them, putting them in a really pretty box and selling them for 60 bucks plus in the, in the ripoffs. Also, it's very rare that you would ever need or see any benefit from gold pens. Don't pay extra for gold pens. Hey, Jimmy John, where's my sandwich? If my Fender Princeton Reverb reissue is biased to 120 volts, is it safe as the wall, if the wall voltage is fluxing between 120 and 122? Yeah, uh, you're fine. Uh, hopefully, if you have a Princeton reissue with new old stock 6V6s, you've got those tubes biased with the wall voltage at about 120 volts, somewhere in the 45 to 55% range. Uh, idle dissipation, in which case that little fluctuation from 120 to 122 is nothing. Yeah, don't worry about it. I am not an Alnico Blue for Vox AC30. I'm a human. Sorry, Steve, have to say that stuff. Yeah, but yeah, 
Alnico Blues are great in the AC30, unsurprisingly, but there are other speakers I like in it. I like the G12H30. I like the, uh, the Creamback 65, Creamback 75. I like the Vintage 30. I like uh, comparable models from Warehouse. I like the Warehouse Black and Blue a lot. Um, some people love Greenbacks. I tend not to like Greenbacks in open back cabs very much, but sometimes they'll surprise you. Like that Greenback in that AC15C1, the video I did with Steve Selvage from the Hold Steady. Sounded phenomenal. In general, though, I find that greenbacks don't develop as much low end in an open back cab as other speakers. So, but yeah, there are a lot of great speakers out there. Uh, I've heard good things about running the Alessandro with them, but I've not tried that myself. The Alessandro is one made by M Minutes, and they were out of production for a long time. So, I've not tried one in quite some time. Hey, Rob, uh, a good manufacturer of Variax we should look for. I would have to go on DigiKey or, or Mauser's site or look at some other electronic sources. I don't have one off the top of my head. Maybe Brad will be able to chime in on that. I uh, can't pretend to know things I don't, but um, you can find them. Hey, Johnny T. I have worked on Fender Pro Sonics, the early 80s, the late 80s, early 90s. Um, yeah, that's a Zinke amp, and um, I don't want to go too far off tangent or spend too much time on this, and it's, it puts me in an awkward position because I've got to state what's going to appear to be just an opinion, but it's, it's actually just a scientific, repeatable observation because I don't have one of those here to show you right now to support my arguments. But avoid any amp during the Zinke era. Uh, they were absolute trash. Ground loops built in. Hideous, hideous wiring, um, dual gang 500k pots for everything, and the only way they got different values is because sometimes they run it in parallel, sometimes they wouldn't, and and really cheap dual gang pots too. The entire thing is just, it's like Fender was running a going out of business sale that no one knew about, including the people at Fender. Someone made money on those amps, but it wasn't whoever was building them, um, and uh, they should never have been released to the market. They're utter trash, and people pay way too much for them because some of them say king or custom shop. Hey, John. Yeah, it's, it's safe, but you have to know what the voltage drop of the old rectifier was and whether you then need to compensate for that in some other way or, or whether you just need to know that, hey, if I do that, I need to then change the bias on a fixed bias amp or change the cathode resistor on a cathode bias amp, you can. Uh, you won't get as much benefit from it as you think. You're going to get a 10 to 20 typically volt um, increase in B plus if you're talking about a, a GZ34. Um, you get quite a bit of, a, of an increase if you're talking with a 5Y3, but you're still... And the trouble is when you increase the voltage in the, in the preamp sometimes, uh, then the tubes aren't operating where they ought to as far as the sound of a 5F1 or the sound of a Princeton reverb. Uh, but you can safely do it. You just need to make sure that primarily that um, uh, the new B-plus does not exceed the uh, capacitor voltage rating and that you do not need to rebias or that you do rebias. Hey, AC. Obrigado. I loved our time in Lisbon. Where, where, where in Portugal are you? Hey, Federico. Uh, I have no experience with Clark or Milkman amps. I've heard good things, but I've not had one on my bench, so I, I don't have an opinion. I'm popping this up here for, for reference. Yeah, Steiko is one of the good ones. I don't know um, if that's where the real high quality starts and goes up. But yeah, $1,000 for, for a truly professional Variac versus 80 bucks for the red one from Parts Express. You know, may, maybe Brad and I are having a wild disagreement on this. I think for most people, the recalibrated Parts Express one 
for a light usage is going to be fine, but you have to dial back your expectations. There's a reason that I have that old, old one that you saw in the thumbnail for this uh, still kicking because it, it's really high quality. Uh, it looks like it's ripped off an old Navy destroyer or something. It might have been. Hey, Jack, I appreciate that. I'm glad to see everyone here interacting. Let's see. Hey, Nick Chilton. Uh, yeah, well, I'm glad you've had no tuning issues with the stability in the Maestro. On mine, as it came in, I really did. And um, it was due to three things, uh, primarily. Um, the fact that the post itself was moving in the body insert and the bridge was moving on top of the post, but the bridge did not, they, you know, on the old ones, and I now on this one have a domed washer, but when you have the bridge which can move on top of a flat washer on a post which can also move, that's just a lot of different friction points and different fulcrums. And on my particular example, that was very problematic. Um, and I'm very pleased with where it ended up with um, a locking, uh, actually I have the non-locking bridge on that because uh, I want it to, to tilt on the domed wheels, but I have posts that go into the body and don't move. So I only have the one fulcrum point now. And I tried some other saddles, but I've been very happy with the nylons and that's period correct sound. As far as the neck pickup goes, um, I, I really like it, but it took me a long time to get the neck height correct. I had played around with different uh, magnets in the bridge pickup. I went to an A2, uh, and then I went back to the A5, and uh, I had to repot the pickup as a result. Um, I, for a while, had some fat Dianes wound uh, by um, Manlius, and I really liked the sound of those pickups, but the chrome covers that he used, the nickel-plated covers that he used, began to age in that weird way that I've seen on some Stumac uh, nickel covers where you can see like a, it's like a honeycomb pattern that emerges. It just, it, uh, they were really good pickups with really cheap nickel covers. And so uh, I took them out of the guitar because um, it was really bothering me to have an otherwise beautiful instrument with increasingly weird looking pickup covers to me where you could just see like the matrix, you, you know. <laughs> there was a glitch. Uh, I probably will use those manliest fat Dianes at some point in the future with different covers on them or gasp shock, maybe an uncovered use in a different guitar. Hey, Dave, thanks for joining us. Always, everyone is always welcome, but Dave more so than others because it is rare for him to have the time to do things like this. So uh, good to see you, man. Let's see. Hey, Jack Bruce, if you want to clean the inside of your tube out, take it outside and get a can of compressed air and spray it out and it'll get all the dust out. Beyond that, uh, the only thing that the owner needs to ever do is maybe, uh, like once every five years, a little bit of deoxid followed by fader lube on the pots only when you begin to have any kind of scritchiness to it. And uh, occasionally, ve not very often, but if you do have noise, you're concerned about it, you can flush your tube sockets out with 91% or, or more pure uh, isopropyl alcohol. Now, if you do that, you just drizzle it in there and then let it evaporate and let it evaporate a day. And, you know, basically you, you flush it with alcohol and then you put some uh, uh, non-fibrous uh, cloth, you know, like a, a, a shop towel, uh, deep into the socket and let it drip out and it'll kind of wick out and take a lot of dirt with it. And then just let it air dry over, overnight. The next day, put it back together. You won't have to do it very often, but that's the best way to do it. There are other ways to do it, but that's all you need to do.
Hey, Wes. Uh, whew, well, you could have a bad pot. You could have a bad solder joint. You could have bleed, but it's most likely just a bad pot uh, or a not great ground. But in theory, when the volume pot is at zero, you should be within 40 ohms of ground uh, on the output jack side, and you're going to be 500K away from signal towards the pickup uh, because you're going to have a lot of serious resistance there. So you should have a near infinite voltage divider. But if you have a pot that does not make great contact between the wiper and the track at certain positions, uh, you can have a bleed. Uh, so um, you may just need to be cleaned. You may just have poor contact. But a new pot, a really great pot, it's 5 to 15 bucks. So don't be afraid to change it. Hey, Joe. Yeah, I saw that. And uh, I, I gave Paul a thanks. And uh, it's, it's always nice. And uh, I love Paul's channel. I, I put him in the um, uh, channels to be aware of a couple weeks back. Was that two things ago? But, um, you know, I, uh, I love it. Not because of, of ego and not because of growing the channel, but it's nice when I'm watching a, a video on a subject I enjoy in this field and I get mentioned, I'm like, hey, people are paying attention. That's, that's, that's groovy. And uh, I love his playing and uh, I love his insight and I love how he, he, he says, I know this, I'm going to share what I know. I feel this, but I don't know why. Or I don't know this, so I'm not going to pretend to. Because yeah, there's a, always that urge when you start to do videos and have people watch you and to try to be more than you are, pretend to be more than you are. And I've had, I've had bouts of that where I've had to check myself. Uh, thus far, I have not yet, in, in fact, wrecked myself. Let's see here. Glenn Jedlowski, current having an, a low no, noise problem with poorly wired amp. Instead of rewiring tweet amp, tech suggested something removing the negative feedback circuit. Corrects problem. Is this a good workaround? No. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by a low LO noise problem, but um, if, if you had a problem in the amp and it was alleviated by removing the negative feedback circuit, it's very possible that the amp's primaries were wired backwards on the output tube. So while removing the negative feedback circuit can be a, I would view that as a troubleshooting step, not a fix. So if I had the amp on my bench, I'm the tech in question, and I remove the negative feedback and the problem goes away, either the grid wires to the output tube sockets have been reversed, or the uh, primary connections uh, to the plates on the on the power tube sockets have been reversed, or in more rare instances, the the hot the, the positive and negative on the speaker jack have been reversed. But um, um, so I would say that your amp has been partially troubleshot rather than fixed. And I'm I that's not necessarily fair to your tech because I don't know all the variables. Maybe there are things that we say as techs that we're trying to make things understandable to a player and sometimes we don't give the entire picture we just want to give enough that the owner has a sense of what the issue is and why it happened and how it can be avoided in the future but based on the information i have which albeit limited i'm, I'm not sure that's this kind of case i'm not sure alan some of the piss veins i've had have been good some of them have been have been garbage um um, it, it has varied wildly by vendor and, um, I look forward to seeing if, if they get their shit really, really together. Uh, and I also have been told that some of the TAD stuff are Pizvane and the, the tubes in question have been very good. So maybe it's a question of, uh, what gets sorted for, for, uh, for, use for sale as other brands, what gets sold to certain dealers, what gets sold to other dealers. So I, I don't know the, the background stuff. Thanks very much, Don. No question, just a nice gesture. Always appreciated. Never necessary, but always appreciated. Thank you very much. 
I still have to be very careful on this thing because right next to add to broadcast on each thing that gets on my screen is ban. And I don't want to ban anyone. Maybe I'll click on ban on Brad just to see if I get a confirm option. But uh, just in case there's not, I won't do that to you, Brad. Hey, steal this name. I appreciate that. Yeah, I'm... Email me, info at sonicaudio.com. Uh, but I am behind on emails, and, and that's one of the things I'm going to do after this live stream. Actually, first, before I do anything, I've got that Champ 12. I'm going to start a, a diagnostic video on, but tonight I plan to spend replying to emails. But um, yeah, it is it's hard to keep up. Well, Dave, uh, the red base is not a JJ Pisvain makes it. That's what I had heard on the red base ECC eighty three, and then someone else said, uh, "No, no, that one is 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 uh, a JJ." And I got out of JJ and looked at, at the red base ECC eighty three, specifically ECC eighty three, not the twelve X seven, and it looked very similar. So, uh, but I'm, I'm going to go with you over the other guy if that's the case. In which case, there's my point. Some of the Pisvains are quite good. Um, but yeah, I had said that Pisvane makes the red base uh, uh, ECC83 that TAD sells, and someone was like, no, 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 that's a JJ. It's so hard to keep up with this stuff. I never used to have to know everything about tubes. I used to just be able to say, all right, this vendor has good ones, and I've had good luck with this brand, and I'm just going to keep going forward. And now I've got to learn all this stuff with acronyms and strings of letters and numbers this long. It's very complicated. Hey, Rob F., I'm sorry, I didn't know that you'd hurt your hands. I can relate. I have arthritis issues, but uh hope you're feeling better. Hey, Mad Max, I have no real thoughts about the new Marshall Studio JTM 20 watt because um, I have not had one in front of me. Um, I hope to get one in to, to go over because everyone's talking about them. I have seen one video by the guy uh, uh, that, that Dave loves so much who did that insanely idiotic r review of the, uh, of the J.J. Jr., um, the Jerry Cantrell thing. But uh, he, he's got a video telling us how great the Studio JTM-20 is. And from what I could see in that video, granted, I'm just seeing his, his, his video. I don't have it in front of me. I can't measure it. It looked terrible. Uh, it looked cheap. It looked like it was going to have a lot of heat issues down the road. But, you know, that's just what I can see from a video. Um, you know, the Studio Vintage thing um, I thought was going to be a lot better than it was, but the output section is bias crazy cold for cathode bias. So even though it looked the Studio Vintage looks better, it, it was really kind of awful, and the origin's awful, but it looks at... Uh, so I would love to be wrong and find that the JTM things now are fantastic. And maybe, D maybe Dave's had one, but, uh, I typically see amps when the, you know, if an amp has a one year warranty or a two year warranty, when it fails, it goes, if it fails during that period, it goes to a warranty repair center. I don't do warranty repairs for very many people because I don't want to deal with all the paperwork and get paid pennies on the dollar and have to justify everything I do. Uh, but once amps are out of warranty, that's when I see them. But I'm gonna try to get my hands on a, on a JTM, uh, the new ones. If if for no other reason, just to know what's hitting the market. I'm still trying to get that new PRX. It was it HRDX20. I can't remember the PRS. Everyone talking about how great they were. But the thing, here's the thing I've noticed. Four months ago, everyone was talking about that new 20 watt PRS. Every channel had it. Everyone loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Loved it. Two months later, they're saying the th same thing about the Studio 20 uh, JTM stuff that's out. Great, best amp ever. But I noticed that none of the guys who were singing the praises of the PRS two months ago, four months ago, actually bought one. So, we'll see. Sorry to hear that, Rob. Uh, it's a likely story, <laughs> but uh, sorry to hear that. 
Hey Clark, if if your if your power is running 120, 122 most of the time, you don't necessarily need to run it on a 